Welcome to Casual Politics, um, Tariq Ali. Thank you very much for accepting my request, and I'm very grateful to you. You need no introduction. You, once you've been known as the spirit of 1968, <laughs> yes. and you're still active, you still give speeches at universities and elsewhere. So um, today, today's meeting is about the EU referendum. But before that, I would like to ask you if your thoughts about the Orlando uh, attacks that happened in the US two days ago. Well, the Orlando attacks are extremely depressing and made one very angry because these were attacks on the LGBT community. That is one has to be one starting point. Whether the guy was crazy or not is neither here nor there. You know, most people who go and blow up innocence are not right in their minds. But we have to treat it as an attack, not dissimilar to the attacks in Paris in Bataclan. Uh, even if the guy was not an Islamic fundamentalist, it's irrelevant. Effectively what happened is that he decided to go and attack an LGBT community in Orlando. He succeeded. He killed lots of people. And the police, of course, shot him dead in return, which means it's difficult to find out what the motivations were. It's a horrific tragedy, but it has to be seen for what it is. And I have to say this, that in the United States, and at least one Christian pastor has come out in public, a white Christian pastor, and said what he did was right because homosexuals uh, are the scourge of this, that, and the other. So this is how it has to be seen, and this is how it should be uh, dealt with as an attack on a community. Because in the media they were dismissing it as an attack on LGBT, so now you're convinced it was an attack on LGBT. Without any doubt. Yes. You know, I don't know why the media is trying to cover up on this. So what else could it be? You know, why are they trying to cover it and up? Yeah, especially on the Sky News with Ex Owen Jones. Owen. Well, you know, that's yeah. irrelevant Absolutely. What, what, which news it is. But there should be no attempt at a cover-up. And now on the EU referendum. So could you first tell us, how did you vote back in 1975? In 1975, I voted for. I voted for mm. the single market, as it was. Yes, but... The also, common market. The common market. I voted for it because some of the arguments being used by the left, I thought, <coughs> were, didn't convince me. And I wrongly thought, I have to be honest, that creating a European space would make it easier to fight for ideas which I defended, progressive, socialist ideas, radical ideas. And I was proved wrong. Uh, exactly the opposite has happened. Uh, that In the decades that have followed 1975, the European Union, as it is now known, is effectively an instrument of the elites. The banking, uh, corporate, political elites that run the world, the Western world, and that run Europe. I really do not believe that the EU as an institution, and one has to be very clear about this, we're not talking about Europe. Europe is not the EU. The EU as an institution. Yeah, it's the EU as an institution is totally undemocratic, largely uh, corrupt, hardly anything they do is progressive. And I'm voting to get out of the EU, to kick them, really. And I hope other countries will follow. So some discussion of a different form of Europe can take place on many different levels. Uh, the Danes have said they are prepared for a referendum. The Dutch are asking for a referendum. The Portuguese left is now hostile to the EU. In Greece, now, 71% of the people have expressed serious dissatisfaction with the European Union. In France, 60%. The figures are high. So it's not just in Britain. And it's always, I feel, unfortunate 
that people in this country are so, uh, being in the EU has made no difference to them. They're so limited in their knowledge of what's happening in the rest of Europe that they just think about here. Yeah, but, you know, the EU has not been good no. for the rest of Europe. And increasingly, there's no equality on the interstate level. The German banks and the German political class is totally dominant. I don't blame them. That's the way it is. So one has to be clear about that. Um, and what they did to Greece, I guess I might have abstained, a contemptuous abstention. Yeah. But what the EU and the Troika did to Greece was just for me Perfect. unforgivable. Yeah. And for that alone, I would vote to, you know, give it a kick in the behind. And did you always see it as a political project? as it was designed to be? <clears throat> well, it was, you know, designed to be a different thing in the sense that they wanted to build, De Gaulle and Adena, the leaders of France and Germany, wanted an EU that was a semi-independent force which could act as something different from both the United States of America and the Soviet Union. That was their aim. It never worked out like that. And the more they expanded the EU, and the entry of Britain actually was not good for Europe. But do you think that de Gaulle was right to veto its entry? I think de Gaulle was right to veto British entry. He said there would be a Trojan horse. And I've always joked that Trojan horse is now too strong a word. One should say Trojan mule, because that is what they are. And that is how they act. And this massive expansion of the European Union has not done anyone any good. So it's in a crisis on every level. But the single most important thing is that it's a machine for corporate globalized capitalism. That is its principal aim. And it lets nothing stand in the way. And democracy and the EU are not bedfellows. They've never been together. and. From that point of view, it's a disaster story. But back in 1975, the, uh, the Labour Party uh, was divided over the issue uh, uh, on Europe, and also the trade unions, they were against it. Whereas today, the Labour Party, overwhelmingly, they in favour, so as the trade unions. Because the trade unions, um, especially Frances O'Grady, one of the leaders of trade unions, she said that the EU is good for wages and for jobs. So why do you think that they shifted their views, especially the leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, who was a staunch opponent of this project? Uh, the From TUC the has shifted its views because the TUC has effectively become a collaborationist organization which does what it thinks is best for itself but in fact what is really best for capital and the notion that the EU is promoting employment I mean only someone completely ignorant could say that when you look at the unemployment levels in Ireland in especially Portugal, youth unemployment hmm? youth unemployment which is very high youth unemployment in these countries is appalling, which is why large numbers of young people from Italy and France and Spain come here, because they work two days a week or they work one day a week and they feel it's better than the benefit they get at home. I mean, it's a grotesque uh, assumption that the EU has been good for uh, employment. I'm sad because, uh, you know, O'Grady is someone I used to respect. But some of the smaller trades unions, of course, have come out sharply against uh, the EU. I was at a meeting yesterday uh, where a number of trade union leaders spoke. So it's divided. The left is divided, the labor movement is divided, the conservatives are divided. Yeah. Europe has divided everyone. The EU has divided everyone. Yeah. In this, uh, but country. the Conservative Party, they more divided than the Labour Party. Yeah. Sorry, the answer to answer your question yes. on the Labour Party, the Labour Party, the Parliamentary Labour Party, is a Blairite party. Uh, it's been that way for some time under Brown and Blair, and so they were not going to change their minds quickly. And I think Jeremy, it was a t tactical decision for him. 
he said he would not appear on the same platform as Cameron and the Conservatives. His own parliamentarians didn't like that. They would have liked to be on the platform and Ed Balls and Gordon Brown and Blair and David Miliband have been appearing together with Cameron to show we are together with Even Sadiq Khan. Even Sadiq Khan, Sadiq Khan has been doing that. I mean, Sadiq Khan, just as a footnote, I regard as a total and complete opportunist who believes in absolutely nothing except what propels him forward and up the ladder. But I think it will end badly as far as he's concerned because, you know, you've got to believe in something. And if you simply believe in power and no principle, have no principles at all, it will end badly. I mean, they fought the most racist Islamophobic campaign possible against him. And look at the uh, result. You know, he has had no impact on it. I think it will end badly with uh, Salih Khan. Uh, to come back to the question of Jeremy, I think Jeremy's instincts are anti the EU as it is at the moment. There is a soft left line, let's stay in and fight to improve it. In my view, this is totally utopian, because the way the EU is structured, there is no way you can improve it. It is unreformable. It has to be, uh, one has to start, wipe the slate clean and start from the beginning, again, if one wants to go in that direction. And... Uh, in, I would have preferred it if Jeremy and John McDonnell had come out on their real positions, which they've held for a long time, which is hostile to the EU, and that would have, I think, probably ensured a vote to quit. But they haven't done it. But one has to differentiate between the Parliamentary Labour Party and its leaders on the one hand, and large numbers of Labour supporters, especially in the north of England, on the other. And in my opinion, a lot will depend on whether these traditional Labour supporters come out and vote to leave or not, and on how many young people vote. Where the Remain people are strongest is 70% of young people between 18 and 36, have this general gut instinct that somehow Europe is better than England. And it's based on very little, really, except thoughts that, you know, we can travel freely. Well, you can travel freely even if, you know, Britain is not in Europe. The Britain isn't part of the Schengen Agreement in any case. And the fear campaign has frightened From others. both sides. Yeah. From both sides. Yeah. So uh, I, I don't think that... Uh, <clears throat> the young people who think in that way are necessarily right, but never mind. Will they come out and vote? If they do, then Remain has no problems, actually, because there would be a huge vote, I think, for Remain, and I think it'll still be close. My own personal feeling, I hope I'm wrong, but my personal feeling is that these opinion polls showing Brexit winning are not dissimilar to the, they're linked to the fear campaign, which was used against the Scottish referendum. Some polls showed the referendum, one or two showed that the independence vote might win in Scotland, but ultimately they lost by 10%, and that could be the margin here. I think they're being used to corral supporters into coming out to vote, okay. but we should see. And um, spot over over six, the polls show that over sixty five, um, they want to leave actually because they're very skeptical about the EU. But however, actually, they will. However, they will vote to remain because they worried about their children's and grandchildren's future. So, do you really think that the EU has has could provide that future to your children and grandchildren? Not this EU, no, I don't think so. I think this EU will regard many of the moderate social democratic policies that Jeremy Corbyn wants to push, will regard them as illegal. I mean, that is the irony of it, that the trade union movement and the Labour Party are desperate to stay inside an institution 
which has made that program redundant. So as for providing for one's children and grandchildren, I doubt it very much. The system is in crisis. There is a systemic crisis and the EU is not immune to that. Um, why remaining in it will improve conditions or make them better? I, I don't know how that argument comes. Getting out won't make them better either. By the way, I don't think it'll make a huge amount of difference whether you're in or out, unless you have a political party in a government which wants to push through radical measures. In that case, it's much better to be out. But they can't touch you. There are also some prominent figures from the left, either it's in the UK or in Greece, that they've been talking, they've been in favour of staying, of Britain staying in the EU. For instance, Yanis Varoufakis, the ex uh, Greek finance minister, and there was an event a while ago, and he mentioned your name. It was an event for open democracy, and he said that I, I urged my friend, he really was one of his friends, that if we remain within the EU, we can change it. So it seems that even some prominent figures from the left, so as the trade unions and, and all others, they really think, they really generally think that we can change um, the structure of the EU if we, we vote to remain. Well, look, uh, Yanis Varoufakis and others say they want to change it. They have yet to tell us how. Who is going to change it? How is it going to be changed? Are we going to wait till 28 governments are elected in each and every member of the EU and then have a unanimous vote to change? That's not how change comes. Or is it going to be changed from below? I think it has to be changed from below. And whether we like it or not, this British referendum is if it succeeds in, in denting the EU by pulling out, will be part of the process of changing it from below. I mean, if you look at what's happening in the European Union today, in virtually every European country, there's a growth of the right and extreme right. It's not the left who's benefiting by being in Europe. Virtually every country. But extreme left as well, like in Spain, Podemos. Spain is in, very exceptional Greece, because there's Syria. never. Spain is exceptional because there's never been an extreme right in Spain on the sort that you in see Greece in Greece as well. The government in Greece. Now. Syriza. <clears throat> yeah, but Syriza, in order to stay in power, capitulated completely. I don't regard Syriza as a party of the left anymore. It made its decision. It became a party not dissimilar to the French Socialist Party. And most of its membership, I'm told, 90% of Syriza's membership, all the ones who are not apparatchiks, members of parliament or paid full time, uh, have left. They have left the party, they walked out. This is a structure without a party. So uh, the left who argue in favor of change have to explain what change and how? Not a single one of them has said how. Make it more democratic? How? You know, you can't do it. The, 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 the structures of the EU are such that you cannot change them easily. I mean, it's not accidental either. So all this talk about let's fight from within to change is very fairy stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, don't you think that this referendum has been more about the blue versus blue rather than, than the substance itself? Yeah, it's the, you know, it takes you back to <coughs> a period in British politics in the 19th century when Whigs and Tories used to fight each other and the masses were sort of semi-passive spectators being dragged into vote by their uh, landlords or uh, you know people in pocket boroughs it's not as bad as that uh, at the moment but it seems to be with this exception that large numbers of people that because it's a referendum you're not choosing between political parties many people who uh, feel angry 
with the status quo, many Labour supporters will vote to leave. Uh, that's the big difference between a general election and a referendum. But I agree with you that it's been a campaign dominated by the blue versus blue. They can't handle it. And Cameron is now trying to hand it to Gordon Brown and the Blairites, saying, I failed, guys. We've got a week left. See what you can do. And, I mean, for the Europhile English media, the Guardian, the Independent, uh, etc., it's uh, unbelievable. They barely published, if you look at what they published, they barely published any serious criticism of the EU. You were just uh, crazed worship, Europhilia, worship of the EU. It's better, but we don't take your word for it, and this, what's happening in Europe shows the exact opposite. What about the quality of the debates compared to 1975? Because there was a very famous a debate at your university, Oxford, back in 1975, Edward Heath and Jeremy Thorpe against Peter Shaw and Barbara Castle. Have you seen any, any of those debates? Have you watched any likes of those debates this time around? No, and I don't think there has been any debate on that level, largely because of the official Labour movement and the Labour Party. Uh, have not participated in them because their position is not the same as the Tories, the Labour Party's position. Every time Corbyn has spoken on the EU, he's attacked many things the EU is doing and he's attacked the Tories per se, including the Johnson Tories and the Cameron Tories. So that makes it difficult to line him up, which is what is annoying Cameron people, which is why they've gone personality, for the Blairites. Personality. Yeah, yeah, but there's no... There is, I mean, the debates between uh, the Cameron Tories and the Boris Johnson Tories and their fringes have been very second-rate, if not third-rate. I, I have to say this, that the debate I had with Varoufakis on The Guardian was quite good. I mean, I just felt that there were three against me, one, so that's The Guardian set it up like that. But... As debates go, it wasn't too bad. It would have been better if it had just been Varoufakis and myself with you know, lots of critical questions, but that, that's the way it goes. But on the level of big politics, no, there's not been a single debate. The 75 referendum, the quality of debate and the level of it was much higher. The first scaremongering project it was about the economy, the second was about the security and now it's about the pensioners. Who are really the losers if we, if we decide to leave the EU? I think, you know, one can't pretend that there will be no, um, there won't be any changes at all. I think it will take two to three years for Britain to develop. Uh, a different way of functioning. But, I mean, I think also a lot will depend on what will happen. Let's see what happens, okay? Let's sort of project. Let's say that leave when it's Brexit. For two years there will be negotiations of the European Under Union. the Article 50. Yeah. So we will still be in the single market. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so it's two years of negotiations on a European level, on the European Union level. At the same time, Cameron will not be able to continue as Prime Minister, in my opinion. He will resign. They will, it will trigger a leadership struggle in the Tory party. Ken Clark said he would not last more than half an hour after the results. He might last a night, let's put it like that. Uh, he'll be out, debate in the Tory party. If there is a Brexit, the Brexiteers will be triumphant. Boris is the likely a uh, candidate, uh, they will probably feel that on the heels of this victory, if they win, they will have a quick general election. Cameron might go for a general election, but I think he will want to give up the Tory party leadership quickly. Let's say there's a general election. In this general election, there's Boris Johnson leading the Conservatives, now very right-wing with a lot of disaffected centrist conservatives. 
There's Jeremy Corbyn leading the Labour Party with a lot of disaffected Labour MPs. Uh, whether some Conservatives and some Blairites join the Lib Dems, I don't know. Or form another part, a new party. Well, or join the Lib Liberals, yeah. you know. They won't form a new party. Some might join the Lib Dems. Some Blairites might think it's better to stay in and see if we can mount a coup against Corbyn. But if Corbyn wins the general election, which I don't think is impossible, that is the end for the Blairite phase in Labour politics. Okay. So Corbyn wins, negotiations are going on. So he just says, this is my program. I want to renationalize the railways. I want to do A, B, C, D, which you don't permit, and we're going to do it. So in effect, he could use the Brexit to his own advantage and the advantage of a radical program. Who knows? I'm just speculating. Let's say if uh, Remain wins. If Remain wins the referendum, um, I think the Conservative Party will be deeply split. Whether Cameron will stay or try and now find a way of leaving and put Osborn in charge is a risky operation, but or Theresa May or one of his people, we don't know. But I think he will probably go then at his own pace, and they still might push through a quick general election, because the entire establishment will want that, saying on the heels of the Romain victory, let's see if we can pull it back a bit, and um, see how much we can get from our friends inside the Labour Party. So whatever happens, British politics isn't going to be the same again. And of course, if there is a Brexit, the Scots will demand another referendum too. So, I don't think politics will just be And there will be, be a the border same. imposed on the Irish, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland border as well. That is not true, by the way. This is part of the fear campaign. Because the borders of the north, north of Ireland and the Irish Republic were never really borders people moved to and fro. I mean, lots of, there were no visas required if you were Irish and were from the Republic and coming to England prior to the common market. It didn't happen like that. So why should the Irish or the Brit uh, English or the British state impose more restrictions? It's not, in there. there's never been any restriction on Ireland. I mean, you know, you were meant to have your passport and you. I used to travel from London to Dublin quite a lot in the 70s, before the EU. No one ever asked me for my passport. I guess now they probably would just because of who I am, but by and large they never did. So this whole thing of, it's part of the fear campaign. Everything is um, up for grabs and, you know, don't do it, don't do it, we'll be some. It's just nonsense. And two last questions. You're talking about Jeremy Corbyn, but some people in the Labour Party, they say that regardless of the results of the referendum, he will not, he will not last uh, uh, long as, as Labour leader as he lost in the Scottish, uh, election, at the Scottish elections. So do you, uh, what, do you, what do you make of that coup against the, the Labour leader? Well, it's completely false. It's... Uh Scotland was not lost by Corbyn. Scotland was lost by Blair and Brown adopting Thatcherite social and economic policies. That is when Scotland decided to move. Corbyn came too late. It had already happened. The majority of the Scottish working class had defected to the Scottish National Party because they thought it was more left-wing and more radical than New Labour. So you have a new Labour rump in Scotland. I mean, you know, I've said to Corbyn and his supporters, you have to write off Scotland. I mean, you're not going to win that back. You have to concentrate on winning England now. Scotland is gone. And pretending that nothing much has happened, that the referendum wasn't an earthquake, that's why I'm saying to you that even though the SNP lost the independence vote, they won Scotland. That's not impossible here uh, if Brexit wins for Corbyn and the Corbyn current inside the Labour movement to get very strong. And uh, you were once uh, uh, 
was were regarded as the spirit of 1968. Are you surprised that the, uh, by the quality of the debate and also by the involvement of youngsters, the youngsters, this new generation, they're not as revolutionary as, as your generation and they're not as mobile as your generation was. So are you surprised that by that they a bit mediocre in in a sense that no, I never that that's active. No. I don't I don't believe that at all. I think there are changes that happen in the world. And these changes mean that each generation is different from its predecessor and its successor. There's no reason why it should be exactly the same. So I don't believe uh, that and I believe that young people today I mean you know we've seen three things over the last few months we've seen a huge campaign in the United States largely motored by young people to try and change the Democratic Party forever the campaign for Bernie Sanders which they've lost it would appear and we will see now what they do but it was an incredibly lively active campaign very sharp criticisms of the oligarchic nature of u.s politics of the control that wall street has and of hillary clinton's appalling role uh, in that country and on the world stage that was for me tremendous really tremendous in england in Scotland. In England, we had a huge campaign by young people to propel Jeremy Corbyn into the leadership of the Labour Party. It would not have happened had young people not been motivated. So, very positive things, and they do things differently. We did them differently, and that's fine, as long as you move forward a bit. And, you know, even as we speak, France is paralyzed by a strike wave and each night the French youth have invented a new way of protest, the night protest, la nuit de boue, you know, the rising night. Uh, every, and all over, it's not just Paris and the Place de République, it's all over in many, many cities of France. They're meeting, they're talking, they're discussing, they're attacking the government, attacking corruption in uh, Germany, um, last week, I think 40,000 people demonstrated outside a U.S. base which launches drone attacks from uh, German soil. In Spain, the youth are probably going to make a party of the radical left the second largest party. So I don't accept that the youth are not doing anything or are, are mediocre. They are completely different from what we were because they live in a different world so they struggle in different ways and I am for them I of course I think they have illusions in this country in the European Union but that's a tiny thing compared to all the other things they've been involved in and in different parts of the world and lastly my last question you you are known for taking up on big base like Henry Kissinger and, and all the rest. So what is your advice for those who want to get involved in their communities and, and make a change? I think you have to be politically engaged. I don't believe that you can achieve anything unless you are politically engaged. And one of the tragedies of this latest form of capitalism, which some refer to as neoliberalism, but one of its characteristics is that it tends to, when it appears to be doing all right prior to the 2008 Wall Street crash, this system tends to institutionalize political apathy. Don't do anything. Don't worry. Be happy is the sort of MTV slogan. You know, we are doing it for you. You don't need to do anything. So... Uh, someone will act on your behalf. And I think since the 2008 crash in the Western world, in parts of Europe and North America, 
people, young people are realizing we have to get off our backsides if we want to achieve anything. And they're going for targets that are achievable. Elect Corbyn, elect Sanders, let's do something we can feel a sense of victory in. Uh, and nothing particularly utopian. In Latin America too, they did something uh, over the last 20 years. So I think in order to bring about even the most minimal change possible, you have to become active. You have to do something. Reading and writing is very important. I do it all the time and have done it all my life. But on its own, it's not sufficient. And before we end this conversation, back in your time at Oxford, you took on many big bits like Henry Kissinger and you had memorable debates, whether it was with Bertrand Russell or, uh, or Malcolm X. So what's your memorable de debate in your view that you've ever had? Well, I didn't debate Malcolm or Bertrand Russell. I knew them and met them. And they were both memorable people. Uh, and I learned a great deal from them, especially from Malcolm, who really educated me on what black America was and what the condition of the African-American people was, because we were kids coming from Asia to study at privileged universities and very little real ideas of what the United States was. Uh, so those debates <coughs> or meetings were extremely important. And Bertrand Russell was, of course, a great philosopher who was very angry with the Americans for waging the war in Vietnam, which he thought was a disaster and a crime against humanity, and set up together with Jean-Paul Sartre, the International War Crimes Tribunal, in which I participated. And I always remember meeting Russell once after he had refused to shake hands with the British Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, then Prime Minister, and Russell said, just put his hand behind you his wrote back it in and your book. Hmm? You wrote it in your book. Yeah, uh, because it's a very important thing to do. I will not touch bloody hands. Even though Wilson, to be fair, had supported the American war but had refused to send British troops. Because I mean, the when party you compare was him to Blair, yeah. So, in any event, uh, that Henry Kissinger, we enjoyed debating. And you were with Michael Foote, if I may be right. Yes. You took on him. There were three of us, Michael Foote, a fellow student from Oxford, Stephen Marks, and myself. And it was Henry Kissinger from Harvard and two other students. We won those students over. Uh, one of them became centrally involved in the anti-war movement. Uh, and Kissinger we had never heard of. They said there's going to be some don, some professor of, uh, in international relations. We'd never heard of him. So he said, is he written? We should read a bit. And then he said, oh, forget it. We just take him as he comes. And, you know, I don't uh, wish to sound immodest, but we did completely demolish him. Mm -hmm. As I think one of his biographies... Yeah, uh, Neil Ferguson. And there's a picture of you in his book, in the new book that oh. Neil Ferguson wrote. Oh, about and the debate. Yes, there's a chapter about the debate. And it wasn't broadcast in the UK. They were not allowed to broadcast it and then you received a letter, uh, a call from Modern Band the Secretary and all the rest that we uh, recommend to our viewers to, uh, to read it. A street fight, my street fighting years. Okay, so I mean meeting people like that is, or arguing against them obviously helps uh, to move uh, forward a bit politically and... Uh, shape your... Yeah, shape yeah, 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 it definitely yeah. did. But thank you very much, Terry. Okay, it was a great Good pleasure. To see you. Thank you very much.